So today for our lecture, we're going to be digging into and exploring domestic terrorism, homegrown violent extremism, and we're actually going to have a little discussion at the end about hate crimes. And I think this is a good place for us to really start to look and build off of what we talked about when we were thinking about the U.S.'s history of terrorism. We alluded to some of these things we're going to talk about today, but we're going to, uh, in that lecture, but we're really going to dig much deeper into it um, and do it today to really get an understanding of these different terms, how they're used, how they are applied legally, what some differences are, and really give us an opportunity to think about terrorism in the U.S. today especially. So, we hear these two different terms, domestic terrorism and homegrown violent extremism, and we need to differentiate them. And they have different definitions based on different organizations, different groups, and how they think about them. And it may also be important as well to think about them perhaps somewhat differently, to think about different ways to counteract them and how terrorism from both groups might be counteracted. So what is domestic terrorism? Well, for basic definition, it's the idea that Americans, that domestic terrorism is Americans driven by U.S.-based extremist ideologies committing crimes against other Americans. So the, there's a couple important pieces to this definition. First, it's saying to commit an act of domestic terrorism in the United States, you need to be an American. So that's an important uh, feature. And then it's also you're committing crimes against other Americans. So it's happening on U.S. soil. That's important to know. But it's also where it really gets into this issue where we're going to differentiate it from homegrown violent extremism is the idea of its identity ideologies that are based in the United States. And so this becomes a little complicated to try to determine how we make a distinction of what constitutes a domestic ideology from a foreign ideology. So in this case, most often times when we talk about domestic extremism, we're talking about far right, far right white supremacists as well as we often lump in the idea of Christian terrorists as well. But we also incorporate oftentimes left-wing terrorist groups as well. But what's interesting is how we make the determination of when a particular ideology is considered domestic is an interesting phenomenon. Like how long does an ideology have to exist in the United States for it to be considered an American ideology? So, for example, we talked about the wave of left-wing terrorism in the 1970s, largely based in occurring um, by individuals who had communist leanings. But if we think about it, communism is actually a foreign ideology to some extent. It's a ideology, it's a economic um, philosophy developed by Karl Marx in uh, German, largely written in the United Kingdom, and developed in, and fleshed out more in Europe in the 1800s, but comes to the United States and after a period of time is eventually considered to be a domestic ideology. When we can look at left-wing terrorists, we argue oftentimes they fit into this brand of, they fit into this brand of domestic terrorists. So it really does raise the question of how long an ideology has to remain and be in the United States before it's considered domestic ideology. And we'll see this, the sharpest contrast, especially when we look at homegrown violent extremism. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but this is just to try to give you an initial definition of domestic terrorism. And if we really want to look at the number of deaths that have been, uh, have occurred because of terrorist attacks, we can see recently, especially since, um, the two uh, post 9/11 and especially in the last decade, that far right extremists, right wing domestic terrorists, have been responsible for the vast majority of deaths related to terrorist incidents. As we can see here, <clears throat> over three quarters, 76 percent of the total deaths related to terrorist activity in the United States in this 10 year period is a function of right wing domestic terrorism. As we can see here. And we'll talk about this more in a minute, um, that um, Islamically motivated terrorism accounts for about 20%, so much less than far-right terrorism over the past decade. 
So how do we think about ter domestic terrorism? And it's important to think about it within a legal framework. And what's interesting is that there's no one statute criminalizing all elements of domestic terrorism. There have been proposals in, uh, recently to try to create a universal statute to prosecute individuals for domestic terrorism. But again, this becomes difficult based on, as we've talked about over and over, the difficulties in defining terrorism. And this has become a major sticking point as well in the creation of a single statute that encompasses all elements of domestic terrorism. But it's not to say that individuals can't be prosecuted for domestic terrorism and there are no statutes on the books. Um, there are provisions that usage of weapons of quote-unquote mass destruction fit within particular elements of certain domestic terrorist statutes. And this, we can see, even when we say weapons of mass destruction, this can apply simply to bombs, as we see with Timothy McVeigh, the individual who um, carried out the Oklahoma City bombing, who had a picture of when we looked at our de definition of domestic terrorism. He was prosecuted uh, as using a weapon of mass destruction under a particular domestic terrorism statute that applies specifically to this type of weapon. Um, and we also see that domestic terrorism, there's some issues that we run into based on <clears throat> whether individuals are allowed to support groups that carry out terrorist attacks. And so a lot of this comes down and is difficult for the U.S. government to deal with because of issues with the First Amendment. So in the First Amendment, Protections are granted to assembly, freedom of speech. So individuals are allowed to form groups, even if they have completely vile, abhorrent ideologies. They're allowed to form these groups based on freedom of assembly. But the issue is, can an individual, like we take an example, can an individual belong to the Ku Klux Klan and be prosecuted if the Ku Klux Klan actually carries out an attack. And so this becomes difficult to some extent because the government has to thread this needle of protections of the First Amendment with freedom of assembly with also prosecuting individuals who engage in violent acts. And so a lot of it comes down to the issue of trying to determine whether individuals in these particular groups that carry out attack have knowledge and intent. So an individual who belongs to the Ku Klux Klan cannot be prosecuted if they carry out a terrorist attack, if they have no knowledge, have no, you know, they don't provide here money, training, documents, weapons, personnel, resources to these groups, then they can't be tried in this issue of aiding and abetting. They simply belong to this particular organization. The government can't circumscribe their ability to belong to this organization. But what's interesting, though, is that in the legal framework, individuals who provide medicine or religious materials to these groups are exempt. And so this creates potentially some issues as well that individuals who treat and rehabilitate perhaps an individual of the Ku Klux Klan who's injured in carrying out a terrorist attack, these individuals cannot be tried for aiding and abetting. So we see some interesting elements here in terms of issues the U.S. government faces with trying to fight um, terrorism domestically based on protections granted to the First Amendment. And I think what's interesting here to look at as well is this breakdown of the number of police officers that have been killed in the United States by domestic extremists, by domestic terrorists. And what's interesting is we see in the previous 30 years or so, the number of police officers have been who have been killed is significantly higher by individuals who belong to far-right extremist groups versus far-left. So it's interesting, oftentimes it's depicted that the right is the party of in the, the ideology of law and order, but interestingly we see that groups on the extremes of the far-right have perpetrated far more killings of police and law enforcement officers than the left has um, in more recent history. And then interestingly we see that um, domestic um, Islamic extremists have killed almost no police officers over the previous um, 30 or 40 years. So really has uh, the numbers are fairly closely split overall between left and right, but 
in the recent in the past 30 years or so it's predominantly done by individuals on the right and this is fits into a lot of far right political ideology that has emerged of individuals really wanting to push back against what they see as the encroachment of the federal government have been willing to undertake extreme action to push back against a repressive government if you're a podcaster you like podcasts i would highly recommend listening to two seasons of a series called Bundyville, which looks into a group of domestic, looks into a lot of domestic extremist groups and particularly focuses on one particular family called the Bundy family that <clears throat> really traffic in a lot of far right ideology have inspired a lot of individuals to take up action in arms against the federal government. And so if you're interested in that, again, the podcast series is called Bundyville. But now we have to think about homegrown violent extremism, and then we can compare the two. So how do we define homegrown violent extremism? Well, it is Americans who are inspired carry out terrorist attacks, who are inspired by foreign ideology committing crimes against other Americans. So we have a lot of similar elements to domestic extremism here. We have it's attacks perpetuated by Americans against other Americans, but the difference is the argument about where the origin of the ideology lies that inspired these individuals to carry out these attacks. And so for the most part, this type of um, extremism is oftentimes associated with Islamically motivated terrorist attacks. And this is where, again, we get back into that issue that I talked about of how long does a particular ideology have to be in the United States or a particular belief have to be in the United States for it to be for it to be considered domestic. So, as I said, the left-wing terrorist ideology, communist ideology that has led individuals to carry out terrorist attacks has been considered domestic. But for in this framework, it's predominantly Islamically motivated terrorists in the United States are not considered domestic terrorists. They're considered homegrown violent extremists. Um, but what's important to remember is these individuals, uh, when we classify them as homegrown violent extremism, are not officially directed to or receive assistance from groups abroad. So an example of a homegrown violent extremist, this individual Omar Mateen, who shot up the Orlando nightclub, killed about 49 people in a mass shooting. He was claimed to be inspired by ISIS. ISIS did not provide any official direction or official assistance, but played a role in his radicalization process. And so this is how we differentiate homegrown violent extremism versus <clears throat> uh, versus uh, far-right um, domestic extremism. And we can see again, coming back to that same table, we see homegrown violent extremists have accounted for about 20% of the total deaths, terrorist-related deaths over the previous decade as compared to um, upwards of 79% from domestic extremists. So we can really see that Domestic extremism, especially right-wing extremism, has become a more significant issue for the United States recently than um, Islamically motivated terrorism or homegrown violent extremism. So how do we think about it legally? Well, it's largely the same as dealing with domestic terrorists. Individuals have the right to freedom of belief. They can subscribe to any religious belief that they want. They can belong to particular organizations as long as they're not outright carrying out violence. They have protections for freedom of speech. And so in a similar way that domestic terrorists operate, domestic terrorist groups operate and can function as long as they are not outwardly committing acts of violence, we can see the same protections given to these individuals because they're American citizens as well and they have the same protections in the Constitution. Um, but what is, uh, what is different to some extent is that there is the capacity to for the federal government and for the government to crack down on these individuals if they are receiving material support for carrying out terrorist attacks from foreign service, from foreign organizations. So <clears throat> based upon the U.S.'s capacity to designate groups outside of the United States, foreign terrorist organizations, individuals who receive support in finance, whether it's financial training, other things from these individuals um, outside of the United States who belong to these foreign terrorist organizations, 
can be prosecuted. So this is one bit of difference. They're not allowed to receive um, any sort of aid or money or training or things like this from outside groups. So that's an area where they could potentially be prosecuted. So now let's dig into hate crimes. And hate crimes <clears throat> come into play, especially when trying to prosecute both domestic extremists and homegrown violent extremists for uh, several reasons legally. But let's first start out with trying to define them. And this is the idea that it's targeting a person intentionally because of their race, religion, national origin, gender, gender identity, disability, sexual orientation. These are various categories that are protected by the federal government. They claim if an individual is targeted for these particular reasons, they can be classified as committing a hate crime. And this is also separated from domestic terrorism. And one of the main differences is the fact that a hate crime revolves around showing an individual attacked, committed a crime against a particular another individual or group based on these particular identifying factors. But for it to be considered domestic terrorism um, in certain frameworks of U.S. law, it has to also be shown to try to intimidate a broader group of people. So this, again, fits in with that idea of our communication strategy with terrorism. If someone simply kills, if a white person kills an African-American because of their particular race, this is a hate crime unless it can be shown that this was meant to also instill fear in a wider population of African-Americans. And that's how the U.S., differentiates hate crimes and domestic terror to some extent. Um, again, this idea of personal malice versus broader ideologically motivated violence. And hate crimes legally. So we can see hate, the first statutes regarding the, um, the use of hate crimes as a criminal punishment emerge in 1968. And they have been expanded over time. So we, see, we saw the adding of gender identity, sexual orientation, over time to protect more groups who might be targeted based on a particular characteristic um, that they have. And so hate crimes really do, are, are really prosecuted much more extensively in the United States um, when the government's trying to prosecute individuals for either domestic terrorism or homegrown violent extremism. U.S. US um, attorney generals um, district attorneys, they will work to try to prosecute these individuals and they often only prosecute them under hate crime laws because of the difficulty, they argue, of the burden of proof of showing the distinction between personal malice and broader ideological motivations. Many of these individuals who have been prosecuted and these individuals who carry out even perhaps what we would consider acts of domestic terrorism don't go free, but they do serve penalty, their sentences based on punishment for domestic terrorism because of what it's argued is easier legally to prove a hate crime that an individual targeted another person based on their particular characteristic than meeting the legal standard to show the broader ideological motivations of instilling fear in a group. So one individual who many people would argue, and rightfully so, is a domestic terrorist, is, in, is the individual Dylan Roof, who you see in the picture here. Dylan Roof was responsible for murdering nine African Americans in an African American church in Charleston um, several years ago. He ultimately was not prosecuted under any domestic terrorist statute, but was prosecuted under hate crime statutes, because it was argued it was legally easier in a more slam dunk case to put him away forever to try to simply show he targeted these individuals based on particular malice, based on their race, rather than trying to make the case that he was attempting to intimidate the larger, larger African-American population in Charleston. So there are lots of questions about this, whether this is right, whether the U.S. government should avoid or state government should avoid prosecuting these individuals under domestic terrorism statutes because it's a bit more difficult to show the broader ideological implications, but these individuals, thankfully, at least still go to prison for what they do, even if they're not necessarily labeled domestic terrorism. But it also raises the real question of how this then gets portrayed in 
the media and whether simply labeling these hate crimes and not using the word terrorism, it really raises the question, are these individuals getting a pass and are individuals and is, is our society as a whole not getting as, if, as informed about the extent to which terrorism is occurring because legally, ultimately, these individuals are prosecuted for hate crimes and not acts of terrorism. So your first discussion question I want to give you is, should hate crimes be considered acts of terror? Why or why not? Should hate crimes be considered acts of terror? Why or why not? And to show here, the federal government has increased its powers over time as well to prosecute individuals for hate crimes. So they can step in in a number of instances, as you can see here, um, to prosecute individuals for hate crimes if they feel um, it's absolutely necessary. So I'll leave it there, give you your final discussion question, um, because largely, to, I would argue to a large extent, individuals who perpetuate and carry out acts of domestic terror receive much less attention than individuals who commit acts of homegrown violent extremism. Much more attention is paid to individuals who engage in terrorism based on homegrown violent extremism. So my final discussion question is, why do you think acts of terror committed by homegrown violent extremists get more attention in the media than domestic terrorist attacks? Again, why do, terror, uh, why do acts of terror committed by homegrown violent extremists get more attention in the media than domestic terror attacks? All right, thanks everybody. I'll have a follow-up with this with a case study on the Oklahoma City bombing and Timothy McVeigh. Thanks for listening.